welcome back, Mom and Dr. Jones, OBGYN, and Mom to Four. Today we're doing the second in our series on TikTok. And last time we went through and corrected some bad and semi-truth information. And today we're going to go through and talk about some information that I saw TikToks of that brought up really great points I thought we could expand on and learn from. As with any platform, TikTok is a platform where there can be great information and where there can be really questionable information. If something sounds a little bit off, like it may not be right, it probably isn't. And it's okay to not take that at face value. That doesn't mean we can't grow and learn. Just make sure when you're doing that, you're getting your information from varied sources, good sources, and from people who don't stand to have secondary gain from telling you something. Okay, first TikTok. So they're showing a package of VCF, which is vaginal contraceptive film and saying, look, it's $10, the only thing you ever need from Walmart. I thought this was a really great opportunity to talk about some of the over-the-counter contraceptive options. This is a spermicide. Spermicides are products that you can use intravaginally to kill sperm before they can make it into the uterus and up the fallopian tubes. They come in many different delivery methods. There's creams and foams and like gels. And then there are these, which are little like paper films. So what are the pros and cons? Well, the pros are that it's over the counter, you don't need a prescription and it's pretty easy to get and it's usually pretty inexpensive. The cons are that spermicides have about a 20% failure rate if they're used as the only type of contraception. It's really, really important to know that they don't protect against STDs. And some spermicides are thought to potentially increase the risk of things like HIV. There's a substance in them called N9, which is what kills the sperm and makes them immobile and unable to get through the cervix and to the fallopian tubes or the egg. That can be irritating to the vaginal skin and cause abrasions, which can potentially allow viruses like HIV virus to get into the bloodstream more easily. Another potential side effect is that people who use spermicides frequently as their form of contraception may experience more episodes of bacterial vaginosis. A great thing to know about, I think a good option in some situations, a lot of people probably wouldn't be comfortable with a 20% failure rate for their form of birth control, but totally up to you. This one is called induced lactation. This is a story of how I induced lactation in order to breastfeed him. As soon as I found out that we were matched, I quit taking birth control and started taking a medication called Domperidone. I started pumping every three hours and I quit taking birth control. It took me about a month to get a full supply, but before long, I was fully breastfeeding my adopted child. I chose this one because I think it's something a lot of people don't know about, and it was clear from the comments that people had no idea that this could be something that you do. I think it's really cool, and usually the process is to work with a lactation consultant prior to or early in the adoption process and let them know that this is something you wanna do so that they can give you some recommendations on how to safely do this. She talks about taking Domperidone. That's a medicine that some people feel really comfortable prescribing and others don't. The data on it is varied, but the basic process behind this is mixing usually some kind of pharmacologic or medication treatment with a physiologic or stimulus that helps with breast milk production, like nipple stimulation, pumping, etc., to bring in the milk supply. She said she was able to, over the course of a month or so, bring in enough milk supply to fully breastfeed her baby, which is amazing. I would say a majority of people are able to produce enough breast milk to at least nurse their baby if they want to, even if they have to supplement a little bit on top of that. So super cool. I was so happy that she chose to post that because I thought it was really great information. Part two. So if you're looking at this, this is your cervical mucus and it lets you know if you're fertile or if you're not fertile. There are a lot of women who think that they have infections, but it's 100% normal. So when you're not fertile, your discharge will be dry, tacky, thick, or like this first one up here, absolutely fertile. It's gonna look like this. I was interested to see what people thought about it and I was interested when I was reading the comments. Vaginal discharge and cervical mucus does correlate with the point you are in your cycle which correlates with fertile status. So when you're nearing ovulation, the cervical mucus gets kind of egg white consistency. So really stretchy and a little bit more thin and watery. 
And early on, when you have a higher estrogen effect and you're not experiencing the ovulatory phase or getting close to the ovulatory phase, it tends to be kind of a creamy white discharge or a thick, stickier discharge. And then that kind of comes back towards the end of the cycle. What people use this for is identifying the part of their cycle where they're most fertile, either for purposes of trying to conceive or purposes of using something like fertility awareness method to try and avoid pregnancy. This is a really great option for a lot of people and even if it's not something you want to use to try to conceive or to try to not conceive, it is still really cool to know about I think because she's right, a lot of people think when their discharge changes they have an infection. I typically tell people if you're having change in discharge but there's no associated pain, no associated abnormal bleeding, you don't have any new sexual partners or any reason to think that you might have an STD and you're not having any other symptoms with it like pelvic pain, itching, discomfort, then it probably is just normal cyclic changes of discharge and cervical mucus that happen with the hormonal fluctuations during your cycle. That being said, if you're on a hormonal contraceptive like the NuvaRing or an oral contraceptive pill, things like this, you're not going to notice this discharge change because your hormone levels aren't fluctuating like they would in a normal cycle and you shouldn't be ovulating, which is what is related to these hormone changes that causes the change in cervical mucus. The next one is about Plan B, which is an emergency contraceptive pill. because I think it's a really great point and I wanted to talk about it a little bit more. So emergency contraceptives are medications that you take after either a condom breaks or you forget to use a condom or basically you have an accident. So your primary method of contraception fails and you need something to help reduce the chances of pregnancy. The one that we're referring to in this video that she calls Plan B is a progesterone based over the counter medication that you take and it typically delays ovulation to prevent fertilization. That's the goal of the medicine. The other medicine that she referenced was Yolopristal Acetate or Ella, which is a prescription based medication that acts very similarly, but you have to have a prescription from a physician to get that one. Plan B effectiveness does decrease with increasing BMI. It isn't an absolute where I see some people saying like, if your BMI is over 30, it doesn't work at all. That's not necessarily true, but it is very true that effectiveness rates decrease with increasing weight. Now she says you need to get Ella or Yolopristal acetate and that definitely is better than plan B for people who are overweight, but it still has some correlation to weight. All of that being said, the effectiveness with either one of them is still better than nothing. I don't know that it is so much of a point to say it is worthless, but it might make you think maybe you should be on a method that works better for you where you don't have to worry about contraceptive failure quite as often. Most likely to have failure are things like condoms or diaphragms or spermicides and the things that are least likely are going to be things like an IUD or a Nexplanon, which is the one that goes in the arm. Things kind of in the middle would be depo shot, birth control pill, NuvaRing. It's good to know, but I don't ever want someone to watch this and think, oh my gosh, if my condom breaks and that's the only option I have, I shouldn't take it because I have a BMI over 30. If you can't get a hold of a doctor to get advice and don't have access to any other options, it probably is still more effective than nothing. Does that make sense? I should just do a whole video on emergency contraceptive at some point. All right guys, like I was saying earlier, there are some great TikToks with excellent medical information and there are some questionable ones. There is no dancing from me on TikTok. I'm Mama Dr. Jones on TikTok and every other platform. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind and I will see you next time.